Hi, and welcome into Surviving Paradise, the podcast that takes a sometimes serious, oftentimes humorous look at the claim by Jehovah's Witnesses that they are living in a modern day spiritual paradise. Welcome in. I'm your host, Stacey Bauman, former elder, ministerial servant, and most importantly, a little guy raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses throughout the 70s and 80s, as I do on every subject. Warning, we try to have some fun. We try to heal. Their sarcasm, humor. So welcome in. Happy to have you here. I want to start by asking you a question. What makes you uncomfortable? And don't worry, I'm not going to try to do it. <laughs> well, maybe I will. Being uncomfortable is really a fascinating subject to me personally because discomfort has such a range. It ranges from annoying all the way to real physical pain. But comfort has always intrigued me. We're all so different. And yet when I ask that question, I oftentimes find out we're really the same on what may make us uncomfortable. There's a lot of similarities. Some people hate the heat. Some people hate the cold. Some people uh, are very uncomfortable around a certain person or maybe even talking about a certain subject. There's so many different things that make each of us consider the question or dynamic that is comfort and discomfort. And I wanted to, uh, going to expose myself here. I got a few things that send me off a cliff <laughs> that make me very uncomfortable. Here's number one that comes to mind. If you want to see me lose my mind, Watch me get my socks wet. I know it sounds so stupid, but man, do I hate it. Somebody drops something in the kitchen. There's a puddle on the ground. I've got a great pair of socks on and I walk through a puddle and my socks are wet. Or you do this in the bathroom after a shower, after you put on clean socks. There are no words for how ticked off I am and how uncomfortable I am in that moment. I can't get my socks wet. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. And it could be a mood changer. <laughs> so there you have it. How about another one? Have you ever been so comfortable in bed that the thought of moving is just out of the question? You know what I speak of. You know what I speak of. The sheets and the blankets are in the perfect position. You're laying there in the perfect position, including the perfect temperature, you have discovered nirvana, perfection, the ultimate comfort. The room doesn't have light. I'm a weirdo and I like to be in the cold in the room. So I get into the perfect cocoon position, the perfect combo of my blankets, pillow, light, temperature. And you know what happens next? Your nose starts to itch and you have to move and you just about lose your mind as you went from the perfect comfort, nirvana, to discomfort and the flat out anger that comes next. <laughs> the difference between comfort and discomfort. And look, I got a couple more I'm just going to throw out there because they popped into my head. I hate popsicle sticks. The, st the thought of that stupid thing in my mouth uh, against my teeth is worse than going to the dentist. I'm highly uncomfortable and I am a neat freak. I hate Dirty stuff, clutter, anything else, welcome to OCD. More importantly, welcome to my version of discomfort. What makes you uncomfortable? You now know more about me than you ever wanted to know. <laughs> I happen to believe that there is one universal thing that we can all agree upon that causes discomfort. That makes almost all of us uncomfortable. Now, I know there's a few outliers and I know some people like it. But the majority find this one thing very uncomfortable. And that thing is change. For most of us, there are few things on our list that might make us more uncomfortable than change. What do psychologists say about discomfort and change? From Psychology Today, What Makes Change Difficult, October 16th, 2020, we get this. Quote, the status quo is comfortable. Another major reason that makes change difficult is that we are not ready and willing for change. See those wet socks. We may be comfortable where we are and even scared to step into the unknown. 
as long as our current state provides us with comfort and security, making the change will be difficult, end quote. And it's funny because I think most of us realize that humans are hardwired to resist change. Part of the brain, the amygdala, interprets change in any form as a threat, and it immediately releases the hormones for fear, fight, or flight. We've all experienced it. Your body in that moment is actually protecting you from, guess what? Change and being uncomfortable. Now listen, looking back at my life as a young kid, and, and the reason I might be more fascinated than most with this subject, I faced constant changes. We moved several times as kids, which brought on massive changes in my life. My parents divorced when I was very young, which put my single mother into a world of change, and by extension, me and my siblings. We moved several times, which meant leaving the comfort of the apartment we called home, our surroundings. We left behind friendships. We changed schools multiple times. In the Bay Area, I ended up going to seven different schools in one town. It's unbelievable when I look back. The faces changed, as did the friendships, something that was beyond uncomfortable for me. Each environment featured change, including something as innocuous as the weather, which bizarrely still affects my moods today. And of course, each move meant a different schedule, different responsibilities for me as the oldest kid, and of course, a different congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses. By 13 years old, I was an expert in change, and it was still, guess what, highly uncomfortable. And yet, as we all know, change is the one constant in life. It never ends. Nonetheless, it's safe to say that most people find change uncomfortable. I think most people listening will agree. So imagine, just imagine, how happy I was as a little guy, and even as I grew to an adult, and what comfort it brought me to be associated with the one and only organization that was going to survive mass destruction and change. And I would live forever on a paradise earth in comfort, in the ultimate comfort. The khakis, the pet elephant, lots of fruits and veggies, lots of great people and perfect skin. Comfort. But as a kid and even as an adult, I just wanted all the change to slow down. I wanted some stability and, well, comfort. Comfort. I'm still a creature of comfort. Are you? I like it. Imagine how happy I was to learn the following and the security and the sense of comfort it gave me about the one and only father that this guy had ever known. And I was even more happy that he wanted me to know this. He gave me the guarantee, the comfort. So we had it included in a book he created called the Bible, which the Guinness Book of World Records says has an estimated print run of 5 billion. So I'm not the only one who's read it. But imagine how I felt when I learned the following and it how it should bring me comfort and how it should bring everyone comfort. Jehovah, the only father I ever knew, had this recorded and he wanted the message to get through. And Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6, he tells us, quote, For I am Jehovah, I do not change. End quote. Ah, whew. okay. There you have it. I'm relieved. I still feel a sense of false relief. <laughs> In a childhood that was always changing, in a world that was throwing constant change at me, I could count on him. Jehovah, the creator of all things, doesn't change. Wow. When you're considering salvation, everlasting life, and a place to go when navigating life's challenges, you want someone steady. Someone that promises they don't change. And well, by extension, neither should the organization that he chose that represents his life-saving work on a planet earth right is that a reasonable conclusion are you with me on this well guess what i know this will shock you but well 
This is where this conversation on change, comfort, and discomfort gets interesting. But just to be sure we got the message from Jehovah himself, because again, repetition for emphasis, the old timers will remember that one. He reminds us over and over again in his Bible, written specifically for Jehovah's Witnesses, we're told, that he does not change. At James chapter 1 and verse 17, we are told, quote, Every good gift and every perfect present is from above, coming down from the Father of the celestial lights, who does not vary or change like the shifting shadows. End quote. Wow, we've got some pretty serious guarantees from Jehovah himself. He says he doesn't change. He makes the point again in the New World Translation through James, my favorite Bible book, by the way, that he does not change. But listen, in my opinion, where this gets real interesting is the verse I'm about to share with you. It might be my favorite of all in terms of what the Bible and Jehovah has to say about change, and we're about to go deep. But keep this verse in mind throughout this crazy episode as we discuss change, comfort, discomfort, and everything attached to it. I present to you Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19, which tells us this, quote, God is not a mere man who tells lies, nor a son of man who changes his mind. When he says something, will he not do it? When he speaks, will he not carry it out? End quote. Got it. This verse, in terms of this conversation on change, is very, very important to me. It's another reminder that God never changes, and it makes a comparison that he is nothing like a common man who is always lying and changing his mind. Huh, I wonder where Numbers 2319 could come into play throughout this conversation. <laughs> Keep it all in mind as we move forward that Jehovah says he never changes, that he's nothing like a man who changes all the time. Keep it all in mind. While you're at it, put on a nice pair of warm, cozy socks. <laughs> but I started out talking about comfort. And how change makes us uncomfortable. And I don't know about you, but when I'm uncomfortable, all I can think about is getting comfortable again. What is it going to take? A movement, a change of clothes, a change of environment. And well, how do I say this? That was really, really challenging for me to do as a Jehovah's Witness. And why do I say that? Well, let's start at the top. Comfort involves trust. Would you not agree? I'll give you some real world examples. You're comfortable when driving in a car because you trust the driver. You, planes, trains, or automobiles. Great movie, by the way. You're, you're comfortable at the hospital because you trust the doctors. You're comfortable buying that car because it comes with a guarantee, a warranty, something you can trust. So you're comfortable with it. So I have to go to the, to the top. I have to start at the top when it comes to this matter of change. Shouldn't be an issue at this point, right? The top is Jehovah. And Jehovah says in the book he had written for all of us to read that he doesn't change. He's not like a man who tells lies and changes. Surely we can trust Jehovah and ease back into comfort, right? Well, I'm going to let you be the judge on this starting at the top. In the same book that gives us the guarantee we don't need to worry about change from the God that says he will never change, the same book shows us lots of places where we find Jehovah, how do I say this, changing. <laughs> and I mean a lot. In many ways, we can safely argue that Jehovah literally created the dynamic known as change. <laughs> I think it's safe to say that. He's the creator. He's the God of change, even though he never changes. Pop a few ibuprofen. It gets better. Looking strictly at the God who says he never changes, we find him changing a lot throughout the Bible. And at the risk of making this a much deeper conversation, 
I'm going to resist exploring that any time you have, uh, well, anything, change is inevitable. I've already stated it. Jehovah lived without knowing anything, anything known in our human minds. Then he made a universe, a planet, creatures. He made angels. He started out with a man living alone with animals, and Jehovah changed the dynamic there by taking the man's rib and making a beautiful woman. Is it safe to say that we will never look at snakes the same again? <laughs> They went from just creepy, slithering things to being able to talk. All changes that we saw in the first garden, according to Jehovah's Witnesses. But look, then there is things like this which have a deeper impact from the God that never changes. At Genesis chapter 6 and verse 6, we get this, quote, Jehovah regretted that he had made men on the earth and his heart was saddened. End quote. Wait, what? We are only six chapters into life's instruction manual, and we have Jehovah having a change of heart and mind? What? Isn't it a little early? <laughs> and are you ready for this? The Hebrew word for regretted, used here in the verse in the magic book, literally means in Hebrew, change of of mind. And look, for the record, when Jehovah changes his mind, it doesn't end well. From the beginning, you'll note that when the God that doesn't change uh, does change, everyone dies. Am I all wet here? <laughs> Pun intended. <laughs> See the flood for those that don't get it. He follows up that fact, this regret, this change, with yet another. In a, a snapshot of how he changes apparently early and often, and people's lives are almost always in the balance yet again. I present to you another quick Bible example, as I like to do, for anyone listening so they can go to the ultimate authority. This time we have a couple of cities that most of us know as Sodom and Gomorrah. And I tell you, this account is fascinating and odd all at the same time because Abraham, a lowly human like the rest of us, who, as we note, changes his mind and oftentimes can lie all the time just like the rest of us, is literally questioning Jehovah's never-changing character and begging him to spare the cities if he can find a few nice people in the city limits. And look, just a quick side note, because I just can't resist. While having this convo with Jehovah, his buddy Lot is in the city of Sodom, offering up his two daughters to an angry mob of horny men. But, you know, hospitality travelers and stuff. That story didn't end well either. I digress. But in Genesis 18.26, in this conversation between a lowly man and the creator Jehovah, Jehovah tells Abraham, I'll save those two cities if I can find 50 good people. Very generous, very generous. First, I always wondered, wait a minute, hasn't Jehovah already looked throughout Sodom and Gomorrah and, and I, you know, already ID'd the good people so he can save them? Doesn't he know how many good people they are and what their names are? Well, apparently no, apparently no. Because Abraham goes on to question him throughout the chapter and he whittles the never-changing God down to an agreement to save the city if he finds just 10 nice people. Very generous of Jehovah. 10 precious souls. Went from 50 to 10. I, well, that changed quickly. And I do mean changed. And a big shout out to Abraham for having the balls to question the creator. But none of it mattered. Only Lot, his wife, and their two daughters get out of Sodom and Gomorrah. But the never-changing God, who has, in this story, already changed his mind, isn't about to change his mind on Lot's wife, who just turned around and looked back at the burning city, so she becomes a salt lick. Lot grabs a few drinks, and, well, he does the unthinkable with both daughters. See the account, don't want to talk about it. No word yet on Abraham's reaction to all of this. We get the convo between Abraham and Jehovah, the never-changing God, but Genesis 26 tells us, quote, Jehovah went his way and Abraham went back to his place, end quote. <laughs> 
Abraham gave it his best shot. Lot went sideways, and well, Jehovah never changes? <laughs> I guess Abraham was the master of mind games. And I, look, I walked away from the entire Bible account thinking how amazing, amazing, I should say, Abraham would be at a garage sale. <laughs> or on eBay. He could get that price down. And listen, there are many other accounts showing the never-changing God changing. But I'm going to stop there. Acknowledging that we're all uncomfortable with change and openly hoping that our Heavenly Father is a source of consistency, that He won't walk around changing everything all the time, we learn first that He changes things all the time. And second, and I'm resisting the urge to go deeper on this, change is inevitable. You simply can't create anything and not expect change, so let's just get it out of the way. Do babies stay babies? Do continents move on tectonic plates and create mountains and valleys? Do cells multiply and create different organs? Change is inevitable. And despite the Bible saying Jehovah never changes, it goes on to give several examples of him changing. And look, I want to point out that, you know, the Bible writers might have something to do with that because they're just lowly men who change all the time and they wrote the character or message of Jehovah who doesn't change but then does change, I think you can figure it out. Time doesn't allow me to explore how Jehovah's Witnesses and the governing body tie themselves in knots, trying to explain the changes away and Jehovah's ever-changing mood. Okay, heck, let's give one more example. And wouldn't you and the reason I give one more example on this is because if you're paying attention to the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses when they give us the uh, snapshot of Jehovah from his book uh, because you know he needed them to expound on him, you'll learn that when Jehovah changes, it's all our fault anyway. <laughs> He has no control over it. Yeah, we made him change. The website, Bible Questions Answered, under the article, Does God Change His Mind? The Bible's answer is the subheading. It says, quote, Yes, he does. In the sense that he changes his attitude when people change their behavior. Well, that seems stable. For example, when God sent a judgment message to the people of ancient Israel, he said, Perhaps they will listen, and each one will turn back from his evil way, and I will change my mind concerning the calamity that I intend to bring on them because of their evil deeds. Jeremiah 26, 3, end quote. Whew, dodged a bullet there. If you never thought you had the power to change Jehovah the Creator himself, well, you just learned that you can. You can change his mood, or even whether you live or die. But he is love, and well, he does not change. No word yet from Malachi on this. He just told us God doesn't change. He may have missed a few things. Apparently, even I, a lowly human, as we saw with Abraham and we see today, have the power to change the Creator. Very interesting. Lots to unpack there about the book, who wrote it, and where this dynamic might just come from. But in closing, the article continues with the question, is God sorry that he created humans? It continues, quote, no, although he does regret that most people ignore or reject him. Sounds secure. Describing conditions before the global flood of Noah's day, the Bible says Jehovah regretted that he had made men on the earth and his heart was saddened, end quote. And well, there you have it. The Bible the most important book in the universe says he regretted even making man, but the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses says that Jehovah is just sensitive. That didn't really mean it. He just meant, please pay more attention to me. <laughs> One sentence and an application only nine ever-changing men could come up with. <laughs> it's truly comical for anyone with firing brain cells. But okay, why is any of this interesting at all? Or maybe I'm the only one interested in it, I don't know. Because while we have a God that says he doesn't change, but then he does change, and more importantly, that same unchanging, changing God has an organization here on earth that we should expect is a great representation of him and source of comfort, 
And well, uh, what do we find? What do we find? And if you're wondering about the king and his son, Jesus Christ, in this drama, the one he has put in place over everything and everybody else in the universe, did you know that we get a guarantee that Jesus doesn't change either? Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8 tells us, quote, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever, end quote. Wow. Jehovah doesn't change, but does. We now have a guarantee that Jesus doesn't change, but Jesus leads an organization on earth. We'll get into that about change and comfort. And well, uh, it just leads to more questions. But staying just for a minute on Jesus, because we gave Jehovah a couple guarantees, we want to focus on Jesus just in case someone in Jehovah's Witnesses may be listening or considering this. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And, and well, uh, does this qualify for a change? Matthew 15, 24 says, quote, He answered, Jesus, I was not sent to anyone except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So I'm going to hover here for a minute. Jesus never changes. He's the same forever. And while in Matthew 15, 24, the same unchanging Jesus tells us that he was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the Jews, his entire ministry, according to his own words, was speaking with, uh, how do I put this for everyone? Here comes some of that discomfort. Apostates, the apostate nation of Israel. If you're keeping track at home, and you can think of the accounts possibly as I reel off a few titles, <laughs> he witnessed a sluts tax collectors, priests. Jesus even selected Jewish disciples. He spoke in Jewish synagogues and was at the Jewish temple and traveled mostly in Jewish areas. His mission in fulfillment of the Jewish prophets was to only the Jewish people. And folks, they were apostates. I know, feeling uncomfortable. <laughs> So for us lowly, imperfect humans, did Jesus change? Because I just read that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But Jesus said that his only focus was in being kind and witnessing to apostates. Because I ask this, a Jehovah's Witness today in 2023 is forbidden from speaking to apostates or listening to them or helping them or being kind to them. And just an update... But the king that never changes now has you hauled into a judicial committee and disfellowship for uh, speaking to apostates. But it goes deeper. You don't have to speak to one. You just have to think like one. You have to have a common sense question about the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. And guess what? You're disfellowshipped. And I can't bring the two together. No logical person could. I have four books of the Bible showing him preaching, feeding, curing, resurrecting, and issuing guarantees of life in heaven for other to uh, apostates. <laughs> so I ask anyone listening or any Jehovah's Witnesses who's uncomfortable, like me wearing a wet sock, did something change? <laughs> Has there been a change with the king? He claims he's the same today, yesterday, and forever. But his whole ministry was being kind to apostate people. And yet Jehovah's Witnesses today can't even think like an apostate person. It can make you dizzy when you consider that the God and Son that tell us they never change, but then do change, also chose a publishing company on earth to communicate to mankind and well, you guessed it, the entire organization and their leaders specialize in uh, change. <laughs> change, as you can see, is such a fascinating subject, is it not? I've always felt that when explaining to every breathing human how to save their life, 
giving them instructions and details should be fairly concrete on how to do that. Am I alone? The instructions would be detailed and locked in in the event of an emergency. For example, if you're on a sinking ship, the instructions on how to get off the boat are pretty straightforward. We see this on airplanes too. But sticking with the ship, get in a lifeboat. The lifeboats are red. We have 100 lifeboats that seat 50 people. They hold people weighing up to 300 pounds. Lifeboats are located here, here, and here on the ship. Concrete instructions on survival. We get them today from those lying, ever-changing men like the rest of us. So you would think Jehovah and Jesus' instructions on surviving the greatest genocide and mass slaughter in all the universe history would be concrete. But how do I say this? Slip on the wet sock. It's uncomfortable. It just isn't the case with Jehovah's Witnesses, which only calls into question how much Jehovah and his son really want to save us at all. Because they're constantly changing. Am I the only one that thinks it's a little messed up that we are to believe the instructions for living forever and the salvation, surviving this mass slaughter known as Armageddon, and how to get on this boat that we call life everlasting, when given to us from the leadership of Jehovah's Witnesses, goes more something like this. Hey, the boat is sinking. Get in a lifeboat. Lifeboats are red. Wait, nope, new light, they're green. Oops, new change, no, they're blue. Wait, they're more like kayaks. Wait, we removed the lifeboats. Nope, sorry, the lifeboats are back. We have 100 lifeboats. Wait, no, that changed. We only have 48. Wait, those 48 only seat 50 people. Wait, that changed. They only seat 23. They hold people up to 300 pounds. Scratch that, only 250. Wait, that changed to 200. Lifeboats are located here, here, and here. Wait, that changed. They're already in the water. Get in line. And <laughs> look, on and on and on it goes. With the boat sinking or the world on the edge of destruction, everything you need for survival or to please the ever-changing, non-changing God is constantly uh, changing. It is constantly changing with Jehovah's Witnesses. It's undeniable. And it's all very strange and tragic. When you consider billions of lives are on the line, according to the governing body, billions, billions of lives, people who've died, who are just waiting. Where is the logic or the sense of security for someone that was a Jehovah's Witness in 1980, leaves the organization, then comes back to it like the prodigal son in 2023? What do they find in Jehovah's organization that never changes? Jehovah hasn't changed, right? Right? Would they even recognize Jehovah's organization if they left in 1980 and came back in 2023? Am I the only one that when you sit with it for a minute, finds that fact very odd? Why would Jesus and his father be in a constant state of flux, including changes to life-altering teachings during the most critical time in human history? You know, we as humans, as paltry, broken down people, have a few things to worry about on our way to paradise. But now we have to worry about the creator and the king moving the ball on us at any given moment. What I do today is fine, but what I do in a week may now be a mortal sin. <laughs> Can you imagine doing this to a child? Because after all, you can connect the analogy, we're all just children of the non-changing, ever-changing God. Can you imagine doing this to a child? Hey, little one, never touch the stove when it's on, you'll get burned. A week later, hey, touching the stove when it's on is up to you, just be careful, don't get burned. A month later, hey, touching the stove when it's on will get you burned and I'll ground you for it. The, that kid, if he's anything like me, will develop a twitch because the parent keeps moving the ball and keeps moving the messaging. They're changing. When considering all the changes among Jehovah's Witnesses in their organization, I like to start with the simple stuff, the sublime. A lot has changed since I was a Jehovah's Witness, and it's only been 14 years. I left in 2009 for good. And even then, 
I was starting to see as I left in 2009, things starting to change in the organization that I had based my entire life around. Therefore, part of the reason I decided to leave and make a change. First, look at some of these sublime things. How about some simple examples of change that are downright dramatic if you sit with it for a minute or you've been a witness for decades and you recognize how dramatic these changes are from the never changing God and his son by way of his organization. Here's a few examples. How did you feel about the elimination of the home book study in 2009? And at some point I'm going to cover these all in more depth. As a book study conductor and to learn that on my way out the door, it happened after I left a few months later, I was in shock at the change. The home book study was supposed to get us through the Great Tribulation. We were all supposed to have uh, flashlight packs. You remember there was even Kingdom Ministries on having survival packs at the local book study house. Oh my God. How about the changes to the theocratic school in 2015? A school that we are told taught ministers to save lives. And now it looked a whole lot different. Repetition for emphasis. Oh boy. Gestures. Who hated gestures? Ah. How about the fact that public talks changed to 30 minutes and were in more of a manuscript, manuscript form? I mean, they didn't want you varying from the message. 30 minutes. I was a guy who gave zillions of public talks that were 45 minutes long and I had to create all the meat. No more. How about the massive changes to the Watchtower and Awake magazine? Study articles. How many are printed? Who gets to read it? The changes are unbelievable. And these, what we might consider the small ones, I, I don't really know what bucket to put them in, the sublime. Here's one that I want to dive down in a little deeper, and this is an example. How about you pioneers, any ex-pioneers out there? Pioneers and auxiliary pioneers or special pioneers? God, there's so many titles. Uh, here, have a participation trophy. Pioneer hours have changed dramatically from when I was a Jehovah's Witness. Back in the day, full-time pioneers were at one point 100 hours, mostly 90 hours. As of 2023, my understanding is they're down to 50. I, I mean, God, makes perfect sense, right? An auxiliary pioneer back in the day, that's for, you know, the second place trophy when you just, you couldn't quite be a really great pioneer, so you just gave a kind of a half-ass effort. <laughs> auxiliary pioneers was 60 hours, and it's now down to 30. And I believe during COVID, they moved it down to 15 for a time. What? And wow, is that some change? From the God that never changes. I guess the God and the King that never change are really, I don't know, speeding it up in its own time. As Stephen Lett tells us, we're at the end of the end of the very end of the end of the end of the last days. So we're going to encourage you spending less time in service as a pioneer. <laughs> Look, I got nothing on this. But I'll tell you what, on this particular one, I want to share some fun with you. I just want to share some fun with you for any pioneers or ex-pioneers out there. Just a moment to digress from this. And boy, is it a fun one. We'll cover it more in a future episode. The Watchtower of July 1st, 1943, under righteous requirements, we are told this from the faithful and discreet slave, quote, these expressions of God's will by his king and through his established agency constitute his law or rule of action for the faithful and wise servant and for their goodwill companions today who will dwell upon the earth forever in the new world. The Lord, that being Jesus, breaks down our organization instructions further and makes them more practicable, really weird word, by further instructing us through his faithful and wise servant. Pay attention here. Quote, he says, that being Jesus, let us assign the field, the world, to special pioneers, regular pioneers, and companies of Jehovah's Witnesses in an orderly way, sufficient for everyone to thoroughly witness therein, and let us place upon each one the responsibility of caring for the new world interests in these respective assignments. End quote for a moment. You'll note the pioneers get their message from Jesus. Jesus made up everything and all things pioneer, auxiliary pioneer, special pioneer. There it is in print. Uh, here is what he says next. Quote, he says the requirements, I love how they're quoting Jesus here. No word yet on how he said it or when he said it. 
but he says the requirements for special pioneers shall be 175 hours and 50 back calls per month, which should develop into a reasonable number of studies and for regular pioneers, 150 hours and as many backhauls and studies as can be properly developed during that time. Huh. And for company publishers, company, well, that's a weird word, publishers, you know, just a sh regular schmo publishers, he says, that being Jesus, let us make a quota of 60 hours and 12 back calls and at least one study a week for each publisher. These directions come to us from the Lord through his established agency directing what is required of us. And for those who really love the Lord and are guided by his counsel, that is a reasonable service requirement." End quote. <laughs> For my pioneers out there, it's getting easier. And while that might seem odd, as the end is even closer than it was in 1943, pioneers went from 175 and 150, and just us normal schmo publishers from 60 hour a month requirements from Jesus, the king who never changes, has changed. He has changed. And those numbers now, as we get closer to everyone being slaughtered and us walking over dead bodies, is now down to 50 hours and 30 hours. The king that never changes has apparently changed. That's right. Pioneering, the title, the misery, they all came from Jesus. Oh my. To think I needed a coffee break after just an hour of knocking on doors. In 1943, if Jehovah loved me and I was just a lowly publisher, I needed to get 60. And as you'll note it there at the bottom of that reference from the 1943 Watchtower, it's only, quote, for those who really love the Lord and are guided by his counsel, it is a reasonable service requirement. And <laughs> <In> notes. <laughs> it's right there in print. And remember, Jesus doesn't change. And while it looks like he's changed multiple times over the past 60 to 80 years, and just taking pioneering as an example, there you have it. There you have it, the sublime. For those among us that used to put in 90 hours a month while eating top ramen and living with eight roommates just to survive, this really gives a snapshot and all new meaning to change and discomfort. Would you not agree? Unbelievable. We'll return to that in the future. But all of this insanity around organizational meetings and service, it just pales in comparison to changes in teachings, teachings and doctrines that have misled millions of people and devastated lives. You've likely heard all of these before, but how about a few devastating examples of Jehovah, his son, and you got it, his organization here on earth changing and how it altered people's lives forever. There are many, but let's just take a look at one example. I'm just going to, in the interest of time, take a look at one example of change and how it's impacted precious human lives. That particular bucket of interest to me today is medical advice. I'm not going to get into blood. It deserves eight shows. <laughs> but medical advice. <sighs> That's right. The God that created man, as well as his son who resurrected dead people and himself died to save them all, has given the leadership of Jehovah's Witnesses lots of medical advice over the years. Now, is it me? Or is it reasonable to conclude that the creator of the human body would know it well and would, you know, I don't know, have a solid, unchangeable handle on all things human anatomy? Is that unreasonable? I mean, it took him no time to take a rib from Adam to make a woman. He made cells, DNA and stuff. He knows the human body, right? Reasonable to conclude he wouldn't be changing his mind on human health. He didn't have a moment where he said, ah, crap, 
I took a rib to make Eve. I should have taken a femur. <laughs> Let's start over and make some changes. <laughs> I don't think I'm being unreasonable here. And it likely comes as no surprise that Jehovah, his son, and his earthly organization have issued many changes, and I mean countless, on all things medical advice to a Jehovah's Witness. How do you explain that? Let's start with just one example. Organ transplants. I'm going to choose this one in the interest of time. And as we do, keep in mind that the creator of the universe, including human beings, has taken time out of his busy schedule to make some changes over the years. These particular changes are well outside what we would consider uncomfortable. No, these changes from the God, his son, and his organization that never change have gotten people killed. Dead. And at the risk of being repetitive, I have to say it, you must keep in mind that we are told Jehovah has been watching man for 6,000 plus years. He sent his son to speak to us personally and die for us. And he had a book published to make sure everyone knew his feelings on things. But apparently, it wasn't until the 20th century, odd, that he decided to share stuff like this with the rest of us. From the Watchtower of 1961, August 1st, page 480, under questions from the readers, oh my God, sit back in your warm socks or in bed, quote, is there anything in the Bible against giving one's eyes after death to be transplanted to some living person. This came from LC in the United States. The answer, quote, the question of placing one's body or parts of one's body at the disposal of men of science or doctors at one's death for purposes of scientific experimentation or replacement in others is frowned upon by certain religious bodies. However, it does not seem that any scriptural principle or law is involved. It therefore is something that each individual must decide for himself. End quote. Okay, look at that. Jehovah and his organization giving us the right to make a choice. Seems reasonable. We're currently unable to locate a scripture where Jesus was talking about organ transplants. Got it. But then, just six years later, we get the Watchtower of 1967, November 15th, pages 702 to 704, which tells us this on the same subject, quote, Sustaining one's life by means of the body or part of the body of another human would be cannibalism, <laughs> a practice abhorrent to all civilized people. It is not our place to decide whether such operations are advisable from a scientific or medical standpoint. Christians who have been enlightened by God's word do not need to make these decisions based simply on the basis of personal whim or emotion. Yeah, you have a few emotions when you need an organ transplant. Oh my God. Back to the quote. They can consider the divine principles and use these in making personal decisions as they look to God for direction, trusting him and putting their confidence in the future that he has in store for those who love him. End quote. Six years. Okay. For the light gets brighter, folks, who might be listening. First, see a past episode, one of my favorites. Second, let us know why Jehovah allowed an untold number of people to get an organ transplant for at least six years, but then one day, out of nowhere, he changed his mind. And why it took him six years and what the impact was to the people who now had to live with the fact that everyone in the congregation who knew they got an organ transplant were going to consider them a cannibal. <laughs> a cannibal. I just needed a liver transplant to keep living, but now I'm on par with people who eat human flesh. Seems like an awful big change in a six-year window. Nothing says uncomfortable change like ha now being labeled as someone who might eat the neighbor they're supposed to be witnessing to. <laughs> no big deal. They're bad association anyway, and they'll just be bird food in Armageddon anyway. This 
is stunning. And if being a cannibal didn't land with the dedicated Jehovah's Witness and the recipient of a life-saving organ, I'm sure the insinuation in that reference that they clearly don't trust Jehovah if they went through with it finished the job. Just the creator making a few, uh, changes. Who's uncomfortable? But Jehovah and his guys on earth weren't done. They weren't done making changes on this one subject of organ transplants that, you know, that got people killed. That wasn't enough. Are you ready for this? Are you comfortable right now? I've tried a waver between downright fury and wanting to laugh until I break a rib. Did you know that if you got an organ transplant, remember, we got 61, it's up to you. We got 67. If you do it, you're a cannibal and you clearly don't trust in Jehovah. We got this in 1968 from the non-changing God and his organization. In 1968, we were told that the demons, that's right, the demons were giving organ transplants. <laughs> What do you do with this? Awake of 1968, June 22nd, page 15, if you'd like to get some spiritual food in. Quote, in this regard, the weekly scope went on to say, did a spirit guide Dr. Chris Barnard's hand during the historic heart transplant operation several weeks ago? A former member of Dr. Barnard's heart surgery team had often seen a spirit figure standing behind Dr. Barnard during operations in the hospital theater. But that's Kevin Opadaji, Chris Barnard's late father, was the immediate reaction. End quote. That's right. Proper food at the proper time. Those genderless demon guys were taking a break from leering at our beautiful human women to aid in performing organ transplants. <laughs> Standing in the surgery room next to the doctor. No wonder Jehovah had to make the change. Don't you dare consider a liver transplant. I went with liver because Jehovah's Witnesses love their liquor. Because a smurf may show up to the surgery or one of the demons that waved at their babies as they died then went back to heaven to hang out with uh, Jehovah after the flood might be involved. Maybe he taught them how to do organ transplants before he changed his mind again? I don't know. I don't know. You went from a personal decision to a cannibal to if you do it, the demons were in there operating on you. It's just unbelievable. It's in print. But it doesn't end there, folks. Because when Jehovah makes changes that get people killed, it's hard for his guys in New York to pinpoint exactly why. So if being a cannibal didn't bother you, or having a demon that knew Noah, Jehovah, and Jesus personally work on you doesn't bother you, brace yourselves. Will this make you more comfortable with the change? In Watchtower of 1975, September 1st, page 519, we get this, quote, A peculiar factor sometimes noted is a so-called personality transplant. That is, the recipient, in some case, has seemed to adopt certain personality factors of the person whom the organ came from, end quote. Watchtower of 1975, September 1st. They, I, look, they had to write this. The end hadn't come yet, right? 1975. If you get a transplant, you're going to take on their personality. And uh, listen... I need to take a break. Give me a few minutes. I want to jump on the phone. I'm scheduling an organ transplant, and I'm hoping to land Henry Cavill's liver. I need a new personality, and let's face it, the dude's got some charisma. What? You can't make this stuff up. You can't make it up. But it's easy to see why Jehovah made a change on this one, right? Imagine if you went into surgery a circuit overseer, but you came out of surgery an apostate because you got an apostate's liver. 
one of many successful organ transplant surgeries performed by well-known demons. <laughs> oh, man. If you're a Jehovah's Witness listening, what do, you, what do you do with this? What are you doing with this? I personally have been out for 14 years, and I feel like, you know, my favorite sock, and I just walked into a puddle in the kitchen. I'm uncomfortable. I can keep listing changes and why they happen. There's so many. But I think we all get the point using just one example, organ transplants. According to the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, Jehovah, the fickle God, has no problem making life-altering changes to his people with lives in the balance. And look, the odd thing is that they know there have been a lot of changes from the God that never changes and his son that never changes. And they even know that there's going to be more. Does that strike you as odd? Oh yeah. In an effort to get out of front of questions regarding change, the fine nine in upstate New York have included a page of references now available on their website under the article titled beliefs clarified. Go check it out. Veiled in the title of that section is the fact that Jehovah, his king, and his earthly organization are a constantly moving target. They're changing. Prepare to go down memory lane and also to possibly punch your monitor. Change and discomfort is just part of being a Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witness, excuse me. And we don't care, as they openly admit, that it makes you uncomfortable. They don't care. They pop up a new page on the website called Beliefs Clarified. Bracing you for the discomfort of change. And look, at the end of the day, this is what really makes me uncomfortable when it comes to the subject of change with God and his organization. They take zero, and I mean zero, responsibility for how these changes have impacted precious lives. None. In fact, I can show you, and I just did, where they actually blame or even shame us for having a few questions about the changes. And what a change that is in itself. The Bible tells us about Abraham arguing with Jehovah. Or how about David? Just go read 1 Samuel or the entire book of Psalms where he regularly, verse after verse, is questioning the God that never changes. They have songs about it in their songbook. How about Job? His endless questions to God. Let me tell you something. When it comes to change, you are not allowed to question the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. And if you're a witness listening in, thankful you're here, but you know I'm right. And you're likely uncomfortable. Never mind that the generation has passed away and gave up everything to tell people it was passing away. And that generation changed in 1995. It overlaps now. You don't expect or didn't get an apology from Jehovah or his guys in New York, did you? For those who were in the 20th century, you thought they would never die and then died. Did they get an apology on the change? When you make such a massive change, we can be sure that the governing body then developed a plan, right? To go back to each and every precious soul that ever heard that message about the last days and the generation not passing away. And then they then corrected the message, right? I mean, they had a full-blown campaign. They updated those precious people who closed the door, who didn't believe it. Lives are in the balance. And they got old info. They corrected that, right? There was a tract campaign or book carts everywhere announcing the change, right? You know they didn't. People made decisions, slammed the door, left the organization, and many more. 
and it's all changed. They were right. And the governing body were wrong. And now they're trying to spin the change. When it comes to how you deal with change as a Jehovah's Witness, it all comes back to you and me anyway. It's our attitude toward change. Some would call this shaming that impacts your life. The guys in New York don't consider this shaming. They consider it fact. From the Watchtower of 1998, August 15th, pages 15 through 20, under the series Strengthening Our Confidence in God's Righteousness, we get this, quote, In the past, some witnesses have suffered for refusing to share in an activity that their conscience now might permit. Was it unrighteous on Jehovah's part to allow him to suffer for rejecting what he now might do without consequences? Most who have had that experience would not think so. Rather, they rejoice that they had the opportunity of demonstrating publicly and clearly that they were determined to be firm on the issue of universal sovereignty. End quote. I encourage you to listen to that or look it up yourself. Because I'm still trying to figure out how those that have died, sometimes in a span of just six years, bookended by a change, can never find themselves rejoicing about obeying what they read in a watchtower and by upholding Jehovah's sovereignty. But hey, that is just one more silenced voice, right? One less person to base a question from the readers around. It can expand to those that never had children or never got a college education or sold their homes or are out of money in 2023 or any other list of ongoing changes in this organization, they will never have those things. They cannot get the time back. They cannot resurrect their dead loved ones. And by the way, as you saw in that reference from 98, you should all just be happy about it. You got to stand up for Jehovah, even though there's been changes and we were wrong. You should be happy about it. Despite change being very uncomfortable for almost everyone, look, we're all adults. We know it's a fact of life, even if the guys who wrote the book tried to tell us God never changes, even if you're the creator, even if you're his earthly organization. And I got to tell you this, there's so much more we could explore on this subject of change as impacted in the life of a Jehovah's Witness as pushed on them by the governing body and the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. But I got to tell you, the entire time I've been talking about it, I've had a song playing in my mind. And I'm sure some of you are going to recognize it. I'm going to tell you right up front, I'm not going to sing it. You don't have to turn off. (laughs) But the lyrics go something like this. I watch the ripples change their size, but never leave the stream of warm impermanence, so the days float through my eyes, but still the days seem the same, and these children that you spit on as they try to change their worlds. They're immune to your consultations. They're quite aware of what they're going through. Changes turn and face the stranger. Changes don't tell them to grow up and out of it. Changes turn and face the stranger. Changes Where's your shame? You've left us up to our necks in it. Time may change me, but you can't trace time. Thank you to the iconic David Bowie. I'm sure you didn't particularly mean it this way or write that song for Jehovah's Witnesses, but you certainly captured the life of a Jehovah's Witnesses quite well, cha-cha-cha changes. And I have to tell you folks, as for me, the next time I walk through water in my socks and I'm uncomfortable and I want to lose my mind, I'll remind myself that change can be good. And I'll change my socks and listen, listen close. As a former Jehovah's Witness, 
I promise anyone listening, change is very good. Thanks for listening this week. Appreciate you all, wherever you may be. Be well.